The Onward Podcast is fine. We are live. One day at a time, right? Yeah. Welcome to the Onward Podcast. Hi, everybody. I don't know why I always start. I always kind of hit my outro like at the end first. I don't know why. Uh, today's been a long day. So hi, everybody. Welcome to the live version of the Onward podcast. Hi, Tim. Thank you for joining. Oh, my gosh. It's saying that they're having trouble on LinkedIn, which is probably where most people are going to watch it. Tim. You're a, you're an expert producer. What do you tell people um, when it's supposed to be live on LinkedIn and you're having problems? <laughs> if you're still there, tell me. <laughs> oh boy, yeah, it's like it's not streaming on LinkedIn. Hold on, hold on. I I saw some other people having trouble on LinkedIn today too. So for everybody who's watching, I know a lot of people were supposed to be watching on LinkedIn. So I'm going to, if you're watching on LinkedIn and you're there, let me know, but I'm going to check. Yeah, I'm not live. Lori, just a minute. Okay. Uh, let me go to LinkedIn. For you guys watching, I'm sorry, but oh, wait, Tim was going to say something. Where else are you streaming? Okay, you can put the link in the comments where, to where else you're streaming. I can put the link. Okay, YouTube and to my Facebook group, but YouTube is probably the best place. But to my Onward Podcast, if you search on Onward Podcast um, YouTube, you'd find it, Tim. Can you find that or do you want me to find it? Let me find it. Here it is. And we are live. So let me just, <laughs> I'm seeing myself live on YouTube. Here it is. Copy. Oh, you got it. Okay. Thank you so much. I would have my producer do it. Let me see. Where is she? This is my producer and she's been sleeping on the job. All right. <laughs> Let me bring you in, Lori. <laughs> wow. See, you were saying That's university. <laughs> This is, this is the kind of stuff that tends to happen, right? I just exactly. went on LinkedIn and I tagged all these people. Oh, there's Jenny. She's on LinkedIn. Okay, good. Jenny, you made it. Because at first it was saying that it was not streaming on LinkedIn. So, <sighs> okay. Well, we're going to get started. So um, I didn't get to introduce myself. I'll just say my name is Emily Harmon. I worked for the uh, Department of the Navy for about 34 years, 38 years when you count college. And I finally uh, woke up and said, this is, you know, what do I want to do? I want to host a podcast. I want to feel my feelings again. I want to have in-depth conversations with people. I want to be a coach. I want to do what I want to do and create a life I love living. Not that I didn't love working for the Navy, but it was time for a change. And um, I think a lot of people kind of have been feeling that way through COVID and things like that. So Welcome. Lori Baker Shenna, Baker Shenna, I appreciate that you are here tonight. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, and you you are an executive leadership coach, and you're a professional speaker. And you know, I told you that the Onward Podcast is all about facing adversity, moving forward, and discovering ourselves along the way. And you want to talk about discovering joy in in Having joy is just showing me that they're having trouble on LinkedIn again, but having joy when through adversity. And I'm just wondering, like, what kind of adversity have you been through that makes you uh, able to be an expert on that? Well, that's a great question. I think, first of all, all of us face adversity in our lives. Um, I don't think we're very well prepared for it when we're children, especially, I hate to say it, the next generation, the, the younger people, because 
we're so <clears throat> detected as children that we don't realize that bad things will happen to us. And so, yeah. but at the end of the day, everyone has challenges. And my first challenge came when I was 12 and my mother died of ovarian cancer. Oh my gosh. And that really uh, set a course for me of realizing that it was tragic, but you have to continue figuring out how to live. And, you know, I had a lot of therapy and, and that was very, very helpful. Um, I also had two siblings who were disabled, older siblings. I had one with cerebral palsy and one uh, with um, was bipolar. Mm. So I had kind of grew up in a very challenging environment. And my father was amazing, which was very, I was very fortunate to have a great dad. But anyway, so that was my first shot at adversity. And then lately, um, and then of course you have the career adversity and all the things that kind of hit you back and forth. But my big ones were... Um, my sister ended up passing away from breast cancer uh, when she was 54. And my brother ended up dying from pneumonia when he was 56. So um, weirdly enough, when I was 55, I was diagnosed with my first cancer, which was non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And that was, that was something that came out of left field because there's nothing hereditary about it. And then this past March, I was just diagnosed with breast cancer. And so I've been through treatment, which is why my hair is so short, because I just finished chemotherapy and it's growing back and I'm very excited. Yes. But so there, so my adversity has been a lot of health issues, but a lot of us have health issues, but a lot of us have you know, adversity in other areas, relationships, um, jobs, uh, you know, um, moving, all sorts of things. So even though mine is a health-centered adversity, we all have very challenges in our life that we have to deal with every day. And my thought is that we have to, A, know that they're going to happen and that cards are going to be dealt to us, whether, you know, whether we want them or not. But number two, how to continue finding joy despite the adversity? Because you, it's so easy to kind of give up and say, oh, life's too hard. I'm so sick, this and that. But at the end of the day, life's about finding joy. So how do you do that? in the midst of so much challenge. And so that's where I'm coming from and, and, and how I have found that you can find joy, even though you have, you know, um, tremendous challenges. When did you discover that? I think I discovered that probably in my 40s. Uh, and I, I realized, I, I think women especially really come into their own in their 40s. And I really realized that, that I that you wake up every morning and you have two choices. You either can say to yourself, I'm going to have a miserable day or I'm going to have a great day. It's a choice that you make. And so making that choice to be happy and joyful really sets the tone for the rest of your life. So I, I think I discovered that in my forties and then I, and it, then it was tested in my fifties when I got my 55, when I got my first diagnosis of cancer, because you know, it's, it was a, a crazy cancer. I didn't, you know, I had no idea, uh, you know, what was going on. And now the breast cancer, it's almost like I'm, I'm, I've been through it. Right. But, but yeah. I think in the forties, yeah. my forties is where I really realized that no matter what, you got to find joy. How, but how do you, how do you, when, how do you just decide I'm going to find joy today? I'm going to be joyful. Because I like being happy, being happy feels so good. And I like being joyful. And I think we only have one shot at life here. So we, no matter what, we have to really grab that joy and find out, first of all, what makes us happy. Mm -hmm. And second of all, how we can sustain that even in tough times. Yeah. So how does, I mean, some people I think would say that's really hard for me to just decide that I'm going to be happy because I don't feel happy. Well, you know, a lot of times I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm a big proponent of getting therapy when you're clinically depressed and, and medication. I think that's really important uh, because we, all of us at one time or another, you know, do get depressed and we do get anxious. And especially these days, we have a lot of that going on. But at the end of the day, if you figure that today's going to be my last day on earth, You'd want to be happy and have a good day. Yeah. And so for me, what's the point of like moving on and if I, you can't find joy? Yeah. And so that's just a, a, a very big philosophical way I look at life. 
And I feel that people like to be happy. They just don't know how. So I have a whole kind of construct that I've put together about how to be happy because there's ways you can find joy and it's a real kind of a discipline, but there's ways you can do it even though you're facing some really horrible things. I want to hear about what you found and we've got some questions from the audience. So oh, that's always Tim exciting. asks, when, when you were first diagnosed with cancer, how did you find that joy? That Tim, that's such a great question. This is one of the things I, I start off on my keynote speeches with, with my, before my breast cancer, this is my other cancer. So I, uh, I was rushed to the hospital for my first cancer with a blockage, you know, an ab- abdominal blockage, and they didn't know what it was. So they went in and the doctor didn't think that it was going to be anything. He just didn't think it was going to be cancer. So I'm a medical writer by trade. That's what I was doing before that. So I know a lot, I know a lot about medicine on top of it. So anyway, so they go into my, um, my small bowel, because that's where the blockage was. And they found a tumor that was this big. It was huge. And they called it a telescopic tumor because it would go in and out. So it would block and then it wouldn't block. And so it was oh, very, wow. a very rare tumor. So I, so I woke up from surgery and the doctor said to me, the surgeon said to me, you've got cancer. And I said, <laughs> okay. Thanks. Uh, I was, it was five o'clock in the morning. No one was there. He just, he just like spit it out. He was so shocked. And he goes, and I, and we won't have, we, we don't know what kind of cancer it is. And you've got two, we we're going to have, we won't have pathology back for two days. So as a medical writer, I know that when you have cancer in your stomach, it can be deadly. It can be in three weeks, you could be out and, 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 and you can die or it can be treatable. It depends what it is. So in those two days, I thought to myself, well, what's the worst case scenario? I have three weeks to live. And then I realized, you know what? I am not going to spend the last three weeks of my life miserable. I am going to take every day, even if I'm in a hospital, enjoy it. I'm going to make phone calls, I'm going to talk, I'm going to do some closure on people that I want, wanted to speak my mind with. I have to tell people that I love them. But I'm going to find joy every day because I'm not going to spend my last three weeks as a victim. So the good news is that two days later, he comes in and he goes, you've got non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And he was totally flipped out about that. But I knew that that's a treatable cancer. So I was on cloud nine and I ended up, you know, getting immunotherapy and, uh, and moving forward. He also said that this is the kind of cancer that can come back and will come back. But I cannot live my life worrying about that because mm-hmm. other because that robs you of current joy. So that is how I, I reacted to my cancer. So when I was diagnosed with breast cancer in March of this year, I had I took the same approach and I have a, I had a very aggressive form of breast cancer. Luckily, it didn't spread, but it's it, it took a lot to treat it. And I said the same thing, you know what? And it's, and, and there's a good chance it's going to come back, but you know, I am not going to spend my life worrying about that. I'm going to live every day, even if I'm not feeling that good and find something fun to do and, and do the things that I like to do. And that is how I'm going to live my life. And it's th- a disconscious decision that I made. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Thank you for asking that, Tim. Good and question, then Tim. He was asking, have you always been joyful, like even before you were diagnosed? Yes, I think I was born joyful. I have mm-hmm. to say, I think that's innate in me. I I have I've always found the silver lining in my life. And I don't know where that came from, but I whatever is thrown at me, I figure, okay what's, what's the, where's the good here? I always try to find where's the good here. What's the lesson I can learn and how can I move forward from whatever is happening? So I'm I'm a very, I take a very practical approach to things that go wrong and I I don't get involved emotionally in it. Like I don't blame myself or, you know, I just figure, okay, this is life. We're going to fail. This is life. What can we do to learn from it, move on and to live a good life? And so I think, a lot of that's innate, but it's, it's really, I think everyone can do it with practice. It is a discipline. It is a practice. It is a practice. It's, a, it's, it's being in the moment yes. um, 
to right now, not worrying about the future, like what's going to happen? Is it going to come back? Whatever. That's the future. You can't control it, but you can control what you're doing right now. Do you want to just sit and veg out on TV or do you want to go for a nice walk out in the woods? I mean, just different things like that. And then you could worry about the past, but, but that's past. It's gone. It's We're gone here right now. What are you going to do? And Emily, you are so right about, I think you, the key word you said was control. Mm -hmm. We have to really be hyper aware of what we have control over and what we don't. Yeah. I have no control over these cancers, but I certainly have control over the way I'm going to react to them. Yeah. And that is where I get my strength. Yeah. You know, COVID is a great example. I actually got COVID back in December and everyone, you know, said to me, well, how did you get it? And it's kind of like an STD. I have absolutely no idea <laughs> how I got it. You know, and, and everybody's like, how did you get it? I no idea. I think, I, th I think my husband gave it to me, but I have no idea where he got it. Right. Mm -hmm. So we were both laid up, you know, a year ago. And, and it, again, I had no control. I literally had no control. We, you know, we, we, we were, quarantined. I mean, the whole nine yards and we got it anyway. Right. But I did have control over, I, we were really hyper vigilant about how we took care of ourselves and, 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 and we didn't end up being hospitalized. That's a perfect example of, you know, we have no control over, we can take precautions, but I still got it. Right. So that is the same, same thing with like cancer, you know, it's like you try to eat, live a healthy life. You know, I eat right. I walk five miles a day. You're still, you know. Yeah. So control, but knowing what you can control and knowing what you can't, you, if you can nail that you're in business because yeah. you can worry about what you can control, but you can't worry about what you can't. No. And, and you know, as the new year's coming up, one of the, I'm getting ready to lead this um, little kind of a, a just a, a session or two where we're going to, you know, celebrate what we had, what we happened in 2021 and our accomplishments and what we're proud of and, and, and everything. And then, uh, um, like dream for what we want in the next three years and kind of put a plan together. And, you know, cause I don't want to be in the same place I am now next year. I want to grow. I want to, you know, do other things, achieve other things, be other things. Um, you know, just have new experiences. And if we just let life circumstances drive, um, where we go, it's like being a, on a sailboat and not even adjusting the sail, just wherever the wind takes me, that's where I'll go. And that's not how I want to live life. Absolutely. I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm a big one on, on, on setting goals and dreaming and, and believing in yourself that you can achieve these things. Because mm -hmm. again, life is so short and yeah. it can be taken from you in a heartbeat. And that really kind of drives me because you just don't know. So you yeah. really want to accomplish those things. You know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm, we talked about this earlier, but I'm a, I'm an achiever too. I like, you know, I've been, I'm incredibly busy with my coaching practice and my speaking. And I had, and when COVID came, I had to cancel a lot of um, live events, which really, and then we ended up in zoom and all that. But this year I had to step off my professional. I had, it was intense therapy and I didn't work from April to I'm starting back again in January. How did that feel? And I'll tell you, it felt fine. It felt just fine because I knew that I, because I prioritized, my priority was getting this cancer out of me and recovering. And I'll tell you with chemotherapy, you really can't do anything else, but mm -hmm. sit there and not do anything, you know, mm -hmm. same with COVID, by the way, you just kind of sit there. I was watching Hallmark movies last Christmas, which I never did because I'm just, just sad. Oh, when you have COVID. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, but, but I just, you know, you just have to, you have to say, okay, I'm going to take this break. People will live. My clients are all wonderful about it. And I've already booking up for next year. I've, it's wild how everyone's just been very patiently waiting. So, but I just was able to do that because I, I knew that I needed to take care of myself. And, and we respect you for putting yourself first too. Yeah. Um, I would just say somebody reached out to me on LinkedIn and we couldn't find a time to meet between now and, um, you know, a couple of weeks. And I said, I'm taking, you know, this much time off over the holidays. My calendar's blocked and they respect that, you know, yes. you meet in January. 
Yes. People <laughs> are so afraid of setting those boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's so important for self-care to set, that's the number one thing when self-care is to set boundaries. set boundaries and people, and don't worry, people will respect that. You, yeah. know, you have to, you have to manage expectations. You have to say what's right. Like, what you know this is what's happening this is my schedule i i look forward and that's what i said i said i think i'll be back to work next january you know yeah and uh but that's really important to be able to without guilt you gotta i wanted to write a book which i never wrote emily called enough already giving up guilt at 40. you know and i'm, I'm 63 now so i guess like you know, 40 but, 50 and 60. <laughs> but guilt is like the worst i mean it has it, it doesn't do a thing for us mm -hmm. it doesn't do a thing so you know, giving up guilt and, and just doing what you need to do for yourself. And I just, it just, I needed to do it. And I'm, I, I it's fine. And I just kind of like, you think of the weight, the lost year, but you know, I've learned a lot and, and yeah. I've, and I've, I've just, it's, it's just, it is what it is. Right. Yeah. So Tim's asking, he's Tim, you know, I introduced you to Tim through LinkedIn, right. You're going to be on his yes. on cancer. So he, when he was diagnosed with chronic leukemia 15 years ago, he was in shock. And he has a really good support system. And he's wondering about you because, you know, you had your, your, your mom had passed away and your brother and your sister. Yeah. My family, I have, uh, I've got, I've got wonderful, my husband and my kids and grandkids, I've got a great support system mm -hmm. and I have a great su support system. I was a professor for 25 years of, of uh, public relations and journalism, and I've stayed very close to my students. So I have a great support system in them. A great Facebook family. And I'll tell you something, Tim, there is a wonderful, there's a wonderful group, a couple of them on Facebook that are breast cancer survivors. And they have some amazing groups that I was able to interact with, which I still do every day that lend support, give tips. And that was very helpful too, because as you know, no one really knows what you're going through unless you've gone through it. So. Yeah, yeah definitely. So his, he said his uncle had, on Hodgkin's lymphoma. And he says, you're giving people hope by sharing your story. Thank you for doing it. I think Tim's the, only, you know what, Tim, if you're still here, I went in the comments on the event on LinkedIn and I tagged everybody and said, hope to see you. Um, you know, you're going to be at the show. And now uh, I don't know, they're going to have to watch the replay. <laughs> replay is great. Yeah, replay is great. Well, Tim, Tim, Tim's holding. Tim is, um, you know. Yeah, he's helping us out here. <laughs> so he used to work in journalism as well. So you guys there, well, we have a lot in common, Tim. Yeah, I'm looking forward to meeting you. Yeah. So tell us about. You said that you've you've developed a um a system. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us? And about I call that? it the solution shift. Solution shift. The solution shift, and it's shifting from from being kind of a negative in in. Um, into a positive. So shifting from kind of a negativity into living in, in, in a positive moment. So what does that mean? That means that you live in positivity and whatever is going on, you figure out what it takes to be positive. So there's a couple of tricks to that. So for example, when the, you, the first thing, there are a couple things you do, but you, when you live, when you live in positivity, you take everything that you have and you flip the script and you try to find the positive in it. And how do you do that? Two ways. One, as we talked about before, was control. Figure out what you have control over and what you don't have control over and don't sweat what you don't have control over. Number, and this is also in relationships to Emily. You know, you're not going to be able to change people. No, no. you know so hard enough to change myself <laughs> yeah, exactly so so you know so figure out what you can control and i mean it's like hitting your head against the wall right and the second thing is practicing and living in gratitude mm -hmm. i am grateful for everything that i have and i don't worry about the things that i don't have or that i'm bad like for every everything that we have there's something to be grateful for for example I'm grateful that both my cancers were discovered in time to be treated. A, number two, that there's treatments for the cancer. B, that I had health insurance that gave me access to great care. I could go on and on about how grateful I am during this cancer journey. And so when you can find out that gratitude, no matter what's going on, that you still have a roof over your head, or you still have 
you know, friends or you're still breathing or you're still like, you know, waking and Tim will know this waking up every day is a win when after you've been through something like that. So that kind of gratitude is really lifts you up and it gets you out of that dark place, that victim place. When I say the solution shift, it gets you from moves you from being a victim to becoming empowered. Because it's so easy to be a victim. It's so easy to say, oh, I'm miserable. Everything sucks. Nothing's going right. It's harder to say, you know what? Everything sucks, but I have this and this and this, and this is what I'm going to do for it. So it's a lot of effort to start living in positivity. But once you start figuring it out, it really is a wonderful practice. And it it just is uplifting. I like what you said about practice. Like, um what are the, some of the ways that you can catch yourself when you're in the negative thought and bring yourself back to the positive? Because sometimes we, we may be in that negative thought for a while before we even like realize it, right? Emily, such a great question. <laughs> Absolutely. We have to start listening to how we speak to ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have to be super present about that saboteur, what we're saying, and the fact that we're negative. Yeah. If you find yourself complaining too much or being just being a victim, like, oh, nothing's going right. You know, I, I, you know, things suck. When you, when you start realizing how you speak and how you think and being really present about it, and this really involves being present, then you can flip, I call it flip the script and say, okay, what can, what can um, I do about this? So basically, instead of living in the problem, you want to live in the solution. What and about that, people that, that's the key. You, know, you know, I'm sure you've run into people that are always repeating their story. Well, this happened to me and then that happened and then that happened. That, that's like a victim story, right? Right. <clears throat> if you were a coach, what's your way? I mean, and you are a coach. So <laughs> what's your way of getting somebody out of that? Well, I, first of all, make them quite aware that they are, they're, they're acting like a victim. Mm -hmm. And we talk about where you want to be. Like, where do you, where do you, like, cause a lot of people, Emily, a lot of people don't, I like to be, a lot of people like to be victims. Right. So the first thing in coaching is that someone who wants to switch to really flip their script. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I work with them and ask them to write down what they're talking to themselves about. And what is fascinating to me, one of my tr tricks of the trade is to have people write down what they say to themselves and then look at it objectively and see if there's truth to it. And if they're living in a world, if they're looking at a lens, this negative lens, and if they just put on a positive lens, things would be different. So it's really about getting into what they're thinking, how they view things, and then giving them an opportunity to figure out another way to look at things. And once you give them that tool, that shift from, from living, you know, really living in the solution rather than the problem. I always say to people, I'll give you five minutes to talk to me about your problem. Yeah. <laughs> five minutes. That's it. I just, I want to hear. And then the rest of the time we're going to be talking about solutions. Yeah. And that's my solution shift. You just, you know, we all have problems. I mean, we could go on for hours and hours. But at the end of the day, what are the solutions? And when you and when you live in that solution, when you live in solutions, like all of a sudden things will pop up and you go, okay, this is the problem, but I have a solution. And when you really, you know, commit to that, you will find that you, your whole life changes and shifts because you're living in the solution and not living in the problem. Yeah. One of the areas I coach in is energy coaching. And it's like when you're in that, that negative story, it's lower energy, right? And you're not, when you're in that negative story all the time, you're not going to see any solutions or you're going to see the same solution that you've tried before and it didn't work. But it's like looking through like a, 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 a toilet paper roll or a, um, you know, paper towel roll. This is all I see. But how do you remove that? Because there's more than just what you see or can think of for the solutions, but you've got to get out of that negative energy. Absolutely. So when you, when I'm coaching, we first of all, diagnose the problem and diagnose that. And then we, we work together to find solutions with homework, 
you know, and, and, and things like that. So that they, my goal is for them to eventually learn clients eventually learn how to get themselves into that positive space. Yeah. And again, oh. but it's a commitment. And I'll tell you, I know that everyone said this 5,000 times, but I've been doing this for, for 30 years, which is a gratitude journal. Yeah. Every night or every yeah. morning, you five things you're grateful for, you know, just, you know, you know, female hygiene projects, <laughs> you know, <I> mean, <laughs> toilets. I mean, whatever, even if you're having a bad day, you know, the sunshine, um, there's some always something to be grateful for. And I think people who had kind of near death experiences or, or dealt with cancer, they, they, or heart disease or whatever, they can kind of feel that you all, you kind of get transformed because you really start appreciating, appreciating all that life holds for us and really, you know, being appreciative and focusing on that. And then, you know, and it just, it all, be, you kind of rewiring your brain. And I know there's been research on that, but it literally rewind your brain to be mm -hmm. more positive. But again, it starts with wanting to do it, Emily, because a lot of people like to be victims. Yeah, it does start with wanting to do it. Yeah. Um, but why does it take um, like a cancer or, you know, a sickness or something like that to get us to sometime to get us a lot of us to snap out of it. I think we're all we're all like robots. You know, we're just every day we wake up, we do the same thing. We don't think about it. We just take we take life for granted is what I think. Yeah. And so it takes it takes a shock like, you know, to to you know, take yourself out of that. I was looking at your website um and all the things that you speak about cuz you're a uh, public speaker. And the list is just so long. It's like the solution shift, which we just talked about, but balancing your work life, managing your energy, um, building your leadership brand, um, leading with confidence, you know, upping your leadership game, thriving through change, which we we're kind of talking about customer service, how to stand out in your industry. Um, it's awesome. All the things that you're able to talk about. Yeah, I, I, um, I, first of all, I love, I, I love what I do, but I, as I've gone through, um, as I, as I've gone through my career, I've, I've, I have found that while people are really interested in, uh, you know, self-help, they also are interested in helping their companies. And so I do a lot of company coaching, you know, and how to be better, how to have happier employees and how to uh, be, do better customer service, which I think is crucial these days. Yeah. And, and, and but there's there's ways you can do all of that. Uh, Tim just asked if I journal, and I'll tell you, I do not journal because I write so much as as a writer and a journalist that I and a public relations person. I, I can't imagine writing anymore. <laughs> so I, I don't even. I don't write. I don't journal. He says uh, he finds it tricky uh, balancing active journaling uh, to get in touch with my feelings and deflecting going into the forest as a cancer survivor. Yeah. 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 It's uh, it's it's tough. It's it's tough. But it's um, I, I don't I think that you just you get this depth of 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 self-discovery. And I think everything just seems so vibrant. I mean, I'm just everything I do is just so much I just enjoy so much of it. I, and I think that's just from all of, you know, the way that I've lived my life. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I got a little bit of it because um, right after I retired in uh, 2019, my children's father got sick from cancer and passed away. And um, so that really changed my life, woke me up. Because I could tell he didn't communicate very much. He didn't talk very much, but he was, I could tell that he had a lot of regrets, you know, because he had been verbally abusive and just the, in the way he had lived his life. And I thought to myself, I don't want to die with regrets. I want to, no. I want to do some, there's some stuff that I want to do. And if I just keep being busy and achieving, that's not what I want either. So I want to be, but I didn't even know how to be. I was telling you that before the show. Um, just to be, to be in the present moment. And uh, pottery has really helped me with that. Have you ever done pottery? No, but I've done yoga and yoga helps uh -huh. me. Yoga it does too. It keeps, you have to stay present or else you fall over. So, <laughs> yeah. So you stay really present and it really, but pottery too, anything that's, that, that takes you out of your, your head, you know, and puts that artistic physical yeah. thing. And it is so important. And to, to live that balanced life too. 
And yeah. I think the next generation is really understanding that, that that balance is so important that you have to have a lot of joy and fun and also work hard. And I think those two things and managing your energy, you know, I think I'm a big, I'm like you, I'm a big person on how you manage your energy. So when I look at, um, when I look at, when I coach people on uh, work-life balance, I, it's more like an energy thing. It's not mm-hmm. where you put your time. It's where you put your energy because your time is, it goes, it, it, you can't renew it. It's it, time is gone. The, like this hour, we'll never have it back, right. but energy is renewable. So if you can figure out where you want to put your energy every day and then figure out how to renew that energy, you can really manage a, a full life, a life of kids and, and work and fun and friends because you figure out how to manage that energy. Mm. So what's an example? Um, well, what I like to say is, and, and then with no guilt, you know, let's say, for example, that you, you're, you're working and you've got a big project and you've got a four and a five-year-old mm-hmm. and they need your attention. Mm-hmm. Well, you're, they're going to have to, you're not going to be able to get their, their attention for that day. They're going to yeah. have to miss mom and you're going to have to figure out what to do. So your energy is not going to be with those kids that day. Your energy is going to be with your, your presentation without guilt. And then once the presentation's over, you can put your energy into the kids. So being able to figure out where you're going to put your energy versus your time is really uplifting and it allows you to get everything done without feeling like you're failing everywhere. Yeah. So, which is what we do to ourselves. Yeah. A lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. But you, but you can, you, you can just figure out where I wake up every morning. I say, where do I need to put my energy today? And then that's what I do. And then, so if the kids need a babysitter, for example, or a, a, a take care of that. If, uh, if I have a big workload, I'll take care of that. But waking up every morning and figure out where am I putting the energy and always save energy for your self care. Yeah. You know, whether I walk every morning for five miles, you know, I was even doing that during my cancer treatment. I mean, just, it's really important to me to walk. And so where are you putting energy, where are you putting your self care, where are you all that, but it's all energy based. It's not time based because time is so hard to to um to manage because we only have hours in the day you know that just made me think of thank you tim it it is a good show i'm enjoying it um it it just made me remember have you heard of the spoon theory no okay so my daughter has quite a few invisible illnesses um she takes beta blockers which make you tired and her illnesses already make her tired and so anyway and but you look at her and it's like you don't look sick. You seem fine. You're, um, but she has to really be careful about where she spends her energy. And so somebody, <clears throat> there's this story out there. If you just Google the spoon theory, someone, a friend was sitting with a friend and asking her, well, what is it like to live like you, you know, because you are having to really think through decisions differently, which is the energy um, than other people. You, you look fine, but I can't tell. So she described it as she went to, they were at a restaurant. She got like, let's say 12 spoons. This is how much energy I have in a day. I have 12 spoons for my daughter. Taking a shower is three spoons. You know, then it's like schoolwork, homework, someone wants to go to Disney world tomorrow or, you know, King's dominion tomorrow. Can you do that? She has to really think or today, how many spoons is that? Now I could borrow a spoon from tomorrow and, you know, I have 12 today. I could take one for, and have thir- use 13 today, knowing I'm going to be exhausted tomorrow. So that's how she has to live every day. She has to really think through decisions that most people don't have to because of her illnesses. Yes. Well, and that's a good example of if you take if you take that example that and make that universal, that's how we all are yes. really need to look at things. Yeah, I never really thought of it that way. I just kind of thought of it with with Anna, but um, it is it is true. All of us have to, all of us it. need to do that. All mm-hmm. of all of us. We only have so much energy, Emily. We really yeah. do. 
Exactly. And where, where are you going to put it? And that's a real conscious decision. But especially when you're, especially when you're a younger person balancing all this, you know, it's, it's, you can do it, but it takes, it takes a lot of um, energy management is what I call it. And boundary setting. I'm yes. Oh, boundary setting without guilt. Again, yeah. that's, those are my favorite things to talk about. It's just, you've got to let it go. Guilt gets you nowhere. It does not move you forward. It's the most useless emotion ever. Yeah. And what about worrying? <laughs> it's probably one now, of worrying is so interesting because, you know, I find myself worrying and then I stop myself from worrying because, you know, again, I, I try to only worry about what I can control. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that really helps me with my worrying. Can I control this? What can I do? But if, you know, I can't worry about what I can't control, like get on a plane, you know, let the pilot worry about it. Right. You know, it's, you can't, right. you know. One of the things that um, in this one coaching program, that's similar to what you do, the mental fitness coaching program, where that you switch from, you, you, you know, create these new neural pathways in your brain, right? When you do this, stopping yourself from thinking those negative thoughts and it takes practice. And so a couple of things that I would recommend, I wonder what you would say is um, to reflect on your day about when you, like I liked your thing about like writing down what you're saying to yourself and then reflect on your day about how you interacted with somebody and it, and if you didn't do it in the way you really wanted to, from like a really loving, hard, hard perspective, and you're you got hijacked by your brain, and you were like, ah, um, maybe imagine yourself handling that situation the way you would really want to handle it. And if you practice that in your head, then maybe the next time you're a little better at it. Because, like you said, it's a practice. Um, some people might say, "Well, I just can't do that," but you can if you practice it. That's right. And that's, it's so easy to just say, I can't do that. Yeah. That's, you know, it's just easy to do. It's easy to be a victim. It's easy to say, I can't do that. And at the end of the day, mm, you, you, you know, puts you, it, it this, this all takes effort. It takes effort to be joyful. I mean, eventually it becomes, you know, seamless, but it takes effort to, to start, to start that. Another thing that I encourage my clients to do is keep a strengths journal. Mm. And what this is, is that every day, write down five accomplishments that you've done, whatever they are, and figure and, and link them to what you what were your characteristic and your strength is that allowed you to accomplish that. So let's say you wrote a story. Well, I'm a, I'm a good writer. You know, let's say you made, um, you know, cookies for your family. I'm I, I'm a good cook, you know, uh, that sort of thing that, you know, because a lot of us are so negative, we need to start looking at us as us positives. What are we doing right? What are we yeah. doing right? Yeah, so I love to, that. To, that strengths journal I find is very, very helpful too. What am I doing right instead of what am I doing wrong? Yeah. And again, that's that shift to the positive. That's that living in the solution, living in that positivity. I like that because I said when you reflect, you know, think about how you wish you had handled something, but then also reflect on what you did really well. Mm -hmm. So maybe reinforce that the next time. And my mind tends to go, try not to be a victim here, but I understand why my mind tends to go to that is because when I was um, in high school, I was a really good basketball player. I was a leading scorer in Maryland, DC and Virginia. And um, my, I could have scored 40 points in a game and my dad would say, good game. Now, you remember that time you went right, you should have gone left or something like that. So it was constructive criticism. And so that's, I think that's a big reason why my, well, plus our reptilian brain does that anyway, but my mind even more so goes to, well, you know what you did, right? So let's work on improving in this area and not celebrating the small wins and the big wins. I, I don't do that. For, I haven't up until now, you know, uh, done that very well. That is very interesting. And when you don't get that encouragement when you're young, that 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 is hard. But that's something that again takes practice. And what I, if, if you were my client, I would I would make you <laughs> celebrate your wins. I would say, you know, that would be your theme. Your coaching theme is to celebrate all the good that you bring in the world, 
all the good that you're doing for others, all the, all the impacts that you're making. And, 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 but the fact that you realize that about yourself is such a huge step into shifting into that, that solution to that, you know what, it's time to celebrate me, you know, yeah. I'm, I, I don't need to be, I don't need to be fixed anymore. I don't need to improve anymore. I've come to the point where I am, good I am good, good and I am helpful. I mean, you know, you get to a point where it's okay. You know, I, I'm, I am good at what I do. And, and, and if you don't think I'm good, then you don't have to hire me. I mean, it's like, I I'm here. It, took me, that, you know? it took me this year. And, and just recently um, my coach was my guest. And she made me turn my screen and explain all of my awards. <laughs> she See, you look that. impressive. <laughs> you know, she, she, she had me stand up and explain every single one of those awards. And two of them are from the Secretary of the Navy, you know. So, so there's a lot to be celebrated. Yeah. And, 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 not, and, not, and, and, and celebrate, period. And no ands, no buts. You know, as a matter of fact, I can, I, one of my favorite things I always tell people is take but out of your vocabulary, mm -hmm. blah, 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 and not blah, 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 but mm -hmm. if you, yeah, take, the words you stop we saying say, the word but. Yeah. The words we say, just that, or like, um, someone said the other day, um, another word is like, or phrase is no problem. But what if you said my pleasure? Different energy, kind of Different means energy. The same, th same thing. But my pleasure is like I'm happy to do it. You know. Another thing we need to stop doing is apologizing. Oh yeah. Only apologize when you really need to apologize. I murdered someone. I'm sorry. Okay, that's about it. <laughs> Other than that, you know, we, we, you know, I, I always, I always, um, I always, call, I, I, I must be annoying as heck too because I always call people on that. You know, yeah. for apologizing. I mean, people I don't even know, like like customer service people I'm on the phone with, they said, you don't have to apologize. Don't apologize. And then another thing that I'm just a blah, blah, blah. Don't get rid of the word just. I am a blah. Like I was uh, at an event and um, and I met a, a woman and she goes, I'm just a student. I said, you're not just a student. I am a student. a student. Take just out of it. So when you when you start looking at how you talk, and being very mindful of what you say, it really helps turn things around. Again, flipping that script with words, with energy, all those sort of things all add up. When you send an email, it says, I'm just following up on, on the last email. Why don't you just say, I'm following up exactly. on the last email. I go in and take out the just now. I mean, I still sometimes put it in there, but I, I really, you know, have caught myself and, and, and do that less. So very interesting. What in, in all this adversity that you faced with, you know, just recently, especially the, the cancer and stuff, but what have you discovered about yourself? I discovered that I can walk around bald and not care what people think. I, you know, I was always, so I just was very careful. Like when I did, you know, when you're a presenter, when you, you're, you know, everything you want, everything because to look good, especially when you're on stage, people are very judgy, which is fine. You yeah. know, and I'm, and I'm not too bad about that, but, but all of a sudden your hair is gone, which is an interesting thing. So, so I, I wore hats for a little while and I realized, you know, I'm just over this. I just can't, I didn't even, I tried a wig. I hated it, you know? So I'm not used to having it's so incredibly short hair. It's like wild. I'm like, I'm looking at it. It's, it's weird. I, my, my, my hairdresser dyed it. Cause she, you know, she just wants the gray, but whatever. And I, for a long time, I didn't have any eyebrows or eyelashes, you know, but I just realized, you know, I don't care. I really don't care what it, I don't care that I, I can go out like that and not worry about it. And I, it was fine. I but, love that. But that was a big step for me just to be able to go out to the market and be bald. And then, you know, people react, you know, they, and so anyways, but you know, it's interesting. My brother who had cerebral palsy, he was physically, uh, he, mm -hmm. you know, crippled and people would stare at him and I learned so many, you know, and he, he never, he never gave it a second thought, you know, he just didn't care. Uh, that was his life. And I just, you know, there's something about that, that self-confidence. It's just like, I am who I am. This is me. And, you know, I can't control 
how you feel about that, but I can control that. So that's what I, I think one of the biggest things I learned that and the fact that I was able to get through chemo and, and, and make it, cause that's really hard. It was yeah. really hard and I was able to get through that. So. Let me ask you a question and see if you can answer this, see if you can figure me out. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't remember how old I was, but I was in my forties, probably just before I turned 50. Um, there was this little kid, uh, that had cancer. So I, um, got my head shaved in support of him. And the next day I had to go speak in front of 200 people. And I knew people were thinking like, is Emily sick or whatever? But I mean, I, I used the number one blade. It was as short as your hair. And uh, it felt really, actually, I left it that way for three years. I loved it. It was kind of hard to grow out and I just liked it short. So I was confident enough to do that, right? But I put up with a verbally abusive spouse for seven years. Why? I think that you felt that you didn't deserve anything better than that. You're right. That's you're, exactly you're right. You, 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 you didn't, that's what you deserved. And you, well, weren't, I, good yeah. enough to, you weren't good enough to um, have somebody who really respected you and loved you, even though that's, a, and that's what I'm talking about. That is the lies that we tell ourselves and we get into these situations because at the end of the day, you are definitely worthy of love. You're yeah. definitely worthy of a, a decent man and a decent relationship. But we, we, we don't allow ourselves to do that. So that whole, the way we look at ourselves, we really need to step away from that and look and say, we're, we're not being accurate. You know, no one deserves that. But yes, no one deserves it. And I actually, I actually said it on a show last night. I said that I had been married before him and I wasn't faithful. And I felt really bad about that. And I've never been unfaithful since then, but I felt that I deserve that verbal. See, so that, boy, that really, that explains that, it. That is very concrete. Mm -hmm. And, and I had kids with them. So it, it took, um, the, it took my kids being impacted for me to get the courage to leave. But yeah. we had a whole show on that. But it's just so interesting that I could be really confident at work, you know, and and I could, you know, do that with my hair and not care what people think. And at home, I was such a different person. It's so yeah, isn't that interesting? I think a lot of us live that way. A lot of us live that way. Or the opposite. They're not they're not confident at work, but they're great, you know, great at home, you know. Yeah. So, and they have very strong marriage, but, but they're just a wreck at work, you know? So it's, yeah. it's interesting, but it's really important if we want to live joyful lives and be with, we have to surround ourselves with people who love us and respect us. And that respect and love starts with us mm -hmm. without yeah. a doubt. That self-love is so important. And I was lucky enough that I was, I always kind of had that. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, I was bullied horribly as a child. And that's a whole nother topic. But my father was very, unlike your dad was kind of, you know, was kind of critical. My dad was just always supportive and saying, you know, you're, you're, you're good. And, 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 you know, and don't listen to them and blah, blah, blah. And um, so I really, I became empathetic that I, I, I learned that when you show up, you can't control how people are going to react to you. You just have to be you. Mm -hmm. And some people are going to like you and some people aren't going to like you. But the most important thing you can do is be you mm -hmm. and love you. And when right. you love yourself and you are yourself, then everything else falls into its place. But it really starts with you because if you don't and I know it sounds trite, we hear it all the time. But if you don't love you, then it's 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 hard for anyone else to 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 penetrate that and to get there. I, I so, agree. Uh, I, something happened recently where about three years ago I had dated this guy and then he wasn't really very nice to me. And uh, all of a sudden I get this email yesterday. Oh, hi, Emily. It's, you know, in his name. And um, 
you know, I hope you, I hope you're still not mad at me. Are you? And, uh, and I just responded, hi, happy Thanksgiving. And then, uh, he said, you know, um, he said something, you know, hope you don't mind me reaching out. And I just said, why are you reaching out? But the, and then I never heard from him again because he didn't have anything to say, but the old Emily would have been like, Oh, he, he, he reached out to me again. He likes me. And, um, I would have probably gone and seen him this time. I was like, yeah, why are you reaching out? I didn't even, it didn't even, it didn't even phase me. I felt, it felt so good that that, that is such progress. And that really, it's a real concrete example of how you've grown. Yes. Yeah. That, that really that's got to be so uplifting. That's wonderful. Really, yeah. Absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Because you, you've probably worked with people like me before that would have been like, oh, maybe he likes me again. And that, and, and he was probably thinking that I was like that still. And I would react that way. Exactly. And he has no idea how you've grown. You know? Yeah. So and, it, and I think I, the thing that's exciting for me is that we do grow. And we, yeah. if we allow ourselves to grow, we can grow and evolve into these people who, who can find joy and who can handle challenges and who won't put up with BS. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Who won't put up with it anymore. Like I have zero tolerance, zero tolerance for BS. Zero. <laughs> you know, I... Uh, I don't, I don't do well. I just, you know, I need people who are straight, who are loving, you know, straight with me, who are loving and kind. And, and, you know, if you're not, then I don't really need you in my life. My life's too precious and life's too short. Yeah. And so it's very easy for me just, just to say, I only surround myself with people who are, are nurturing and who, who really, who really add to my life. You know, I've gotten rid of all the people in my life who who are just, you know, suck the life out of me. You know, I did that years ago. Yeah. People here are, you know, they just really and that's really important. Yeah. And just, you know, surround yourself. Yes. Well, I really appreciate you being on my show. And Tim. So fun, Emily. <laughs> Tim, thank you for being our sole guest. Uh, right after I reached out to everybody on LinkedIn saying you're joining us, right? So, um, Tim, I think you have a live show at nine tonight. I hope you're able to broadcast on LinkedIn. Um, I saw one other show today that had had trouble. So I'm not sure what the issue is. But look, the old Emily would have been all stressed out, worried. What am I going to do? I can't control this. Right? No, not at all. And this will be rebroadcast like it's going to be available mm -hmm. on YouTube and everything, right? Um, yeah, it is on YouTube now. So what I will do is I'll go into LinkedIn and I'll post the YouTube link and make sure people can go back and watch it there. And then probably in February, I'll, I'll, I'll email you. It'll be out as a regular podcast episode. Perfect. And I'll publish a couple of good clips with it and uh, I'm on my LinkedIn and I'll tag you. So Tim, awesome. you're only going to be a guest on the show tonight. Okay. We'll give them a heads up that, um, yeah, the beauty of multi-streaming, right? Give them a heads up that my producer was asleep on the job over here in the corner. Pearl. So cute. <laughs> Tim, it was so nice to meet you. Thank you for being so supportive. Um, oh, oh, Nick, Nick hey, <laughs> how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. You can watch the replay, Nicholas. Thank you. If, maybe you were there the whole time and we didn't know it, but thank you so much for joining oh, us. So nice to hear, see you. And he I haven't, long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, professor. So what did you teach? Uh, public relations, okay. journalism and public relations. So it was really fun. I, that's where I be decided to become a motivational speaker because I love motivating my students. You know, students always heard, you know, there's no jobs, this and that. And I was always a big supporter of what they could do. So that's awesome. So, so is that, what's your doctorate in? Pardon? What, you have a doctorate? Yeah, in organizational leadership. Organizational leadership. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah, I can't wait to connect with you too, Tim. It's yeah. wonderful. And Emily, this has been so great. I, I wish you all the best and I hope you have a beautiful holiday season and a wonderful 2022. And I hope we can stay in touch. This hey, has been a pure joy and a great way for me to jump back into the water after being off of this for uh, many, many months. So it made me feel very, very good. So thank you. Yes, thank you. And that's Lori's uh, website if you want to check it out. It's an awesome website and you offer, you know, public speaking on so many different topics and everything. So 
Yeah. I'm going to put you in the green room for just a minute, Lori. Thank okay. you. Play my outro. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate you. I'll be live two times next week. I'll publish those soon. The Onward Podcast is sponsored by Emily Harmon Coaching and Consulting. Visit my website, emilyharmon.com to learn more about my coaching programs and how you can work with me. Let's move onward together.